Hey friends, welcome back to another Seed Talk with Lisa and Lane. Hey Lane. Hello Lisa, are you loving that we're heading into fall? I am. And you know, yesterday I met somebody at, um, you know, the coffee shop and there was pumpkin spice signs everywhere. Uh-oh. So time that, that fall is here, right? So yeah, I'm loving it. So friends, we appreciate you so much dropping in here. And just a reminder that this podcast is made possible by the gardenersworkshop.com. And when you find yourself in the need of gardening tools, seeds, supplies, books, online courses. If you need any kind of direction, we are here to help and support you. And you can find all that over at thegardenersworkshop.com. So Lane, what's up today? All right. So today is going to be the final installment of this Troubles series that we've been doing all September. So we've been addressing all sorts of different cool flower troubles from timing to germination to seedling issues. And now the last episode we're doing in this series is going to be all about direct seeding troubles. So people having problems with things not sprouting, weeds taking over their beds, not having a thick stand of plants ever. So we're just going to try to address some of those problems that we hear about all the time. Boy, those are three subjects, those that you just mentioned that we hear questions about constantly. Oh, right. yes. Awesome. So let's jump in. Okay, so we're going to start off with the broadest topic. This might have the longest answer of any of these, Lisa, and it's none of my direct sown seeds seem to be sprouting. Why might this be happening? Well, I would say there's a couple of reasons. Probably the most frequent problem is temperature. It's still too hot out outside. So, so often, you know, we're also excited to get our seeds in the ground so we don't miss our window, but yet it's still 85 and 90 degrees sometimes, or even 80 degrees. Um, And truly cool season hardy annuals just are not going to break dormancy and sprout during those conditions. And I especially would be suspicious of that if you have multiple different types of seeds that aren't sprouting, right? That's almost always a sign that there's something going wrong in the environment. The other thing I would think of, particularly if you didn't think about this, is did the seed get covered with soil when it shouldn't have or vice versa? Um, Literally, I carry my cool season, my cool flower book to the garden when I'm direct sowing because I don't memorize that stuff either. You know, I look on every single, you know, I have the book open to that page and it tells you right in there. Or if you're buying your seeds from us, our seed packets say that. Um, So that's just information that you just need to look before you sow the seed. Um, So those were my two first thoughts. Lisa, what are the ideal temperature conditions for direct sowing cool flowers outdoors in the fall? Sure. So I'm really looking at usually nighttime temperatures because most often the nighttime temperatures are kind of a sign of what's going to happen during the day too. But I'm looking for nighttime temperatures to hit 60 or so. And that's much later than now, you know, I mean, so you really and, you know, you can't guess. You need to look at a weather app and see what is the, I'm literally right now looking at the weather app and nighttime temperatures are still, we're 65, 67, 66, 66, you know, so we're still in the mid sixties, but two weeks from now, we're starting to get down to 61 and 62. And that's what we're looking for. So the daytime temperatures are in the seventies during the seventies, during the day, And the low 60s or even into the 50s at night is like best case scenario. Yeah. So I would also add on to what you said, something similar that we've said in some of the other episodes in our trouble series is to make sure the seed you're sowing is something that actually does like to be sown directly outdoors. Because there's a reason a lot of times that certain seeds we recommend transplanting rather than sowing directly outdoors. Yeah, and that is a great point, Lane. I mean, it's not about the way that you find convenient to start the seed. It's the easiest and most effective way to start the seed to get success, right? So yeah, that's a good one too. And then I also think a lot of people, especially like we've been having a dry spell here, Lisa, a lot of people don't realize how important it is to keep that seed bed moist 
yes. during the entire germination process. Can you talk about that and how frequently in your conditions with your soil, how often you tend to water your direct seeded beds after sowing them? Sure. So it totally depends on what the weather is doing, right? Um, but, you know, Dave Dowling and Dave has kind of trained me in this now, especially over the last few years with such sporadic weather. He says that direct sown beds should be watered every single day until they're sprouting and up um, because all it takes is dry conditions to dry that out. And literally, it'll stop the seeds progress of sprouting and it can actually cause it to abort, you know, if it gets totally dried out. Um, so that's what my motto is now. Um, if we don't get rain, um, is to water. And see, I find that it's a really easy thing to do. If you plant in a little trough, like we recommend, which is um, easy to see where you're supposed to water, you only water in the trough so you can quickly just fill it up and move on about your business. It's just a really easy task to do. And so that's what we go with now. If it doesn't rain, we're watering every day for direct sown seeds. And then something else that can bother people is a lot of times seeds outdoors are very attractive to all sorts of creatures from insects to birds to rodents to all sorts of things. Yeah. And I mean, ants bless their hearts. Ants are good bugs. You know, they help us a yes. lot. They can carry seeds off. There's just a lot of things that can happen. The bottom line is for a commercial grower, starting transplants is far more efficient less work, more cost effective because you have to over sow out in the garden and you don't do that with transplants. Um, so yeah, I, my first choice is always, if I can start it inside, we start it inside. And I'm just loving looking at that Bupleurum picture that oh. you up uh, Lane. So friends, if you're listening to this on a podcast app, please know that we have a YouTube channel and Lane puts together a beautiful PowerPoint so you can see, and there's several stages of Bupleurum seedlings just sprouting up to a little bit bigger. So I, I can't wait to have that in my garden again this year. Oh, me neither. Lisa, can you talk about installing floating row cover after sowing your seeds to help retain moisture and provide protection from the wind as well as some of the critters we've mentioned? Sure. Um, so floating row covers, um, it's called floating. That's indicating that it's the super lightweight row cover. And that means you don't have to use hoops with it. However, I do use hoops most of the time. But when you direct sow, if you simply want to protect your seed bed from varmints getting it, you can actually put the row cover down. And I do it a little loose, weight it down um, just to help the bed stay moist on top and to prevent birds from actually getting to it. And in fact, um, you know, if you if your conditions are a little questionable on how warm they get during the day, you can do the very same thing with the insect netting. Um, but the insect netting doesn't trap as much thermal mass, so it doesn't stay as warm underneath. So that might be another good choice um, to try that. So if you're having issues with a bunch of different types and varieties of seeds not sprouting after sowing them outdoors, most commonly it's some sort of a temperature problem. Yeah. So try to look for those temperatures like Lisa described ideally. Make sure that it is a seed that wants to be direct sown, that's recommended to be direct sown, and make sure you're either covering or not covering the seeds depending on their preferences. And even if you're not covering the seed, which we will talk about surface sown seeds in just a minute, make sure you're still tamping that seed down yeah. into the soil to get good seed to soil contact and then keep that seed bed moist throughout the entire germination process. And if you're having issues with birds and things trying to eat your seeds, try some floating row cover and that might be able to help you out. Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, I was a terrible direct sower for years and I, I mean, it's like, I was just, I had all these seeds and going out in my garden and planting them and not really paying attention to just some of these basic, simple things. And my world changed once I realized and followed those. So it can take you from a disaster to an overnight success just following some of these tips. 
Yeah. And one other thing that could affect it is if you sowed your seeds on a really windy day, mm. those seeds really could have blown away. Or if you sowed them and there was a really big downpour or a storm yeah. that lasted multiple days, they could have been washed away or just buried deeper than they wanted to be buried. So that's another thing to consider if you're having a mass failure on all your seeds. Good point. Okay. Now we're going to move on to surface sown seeds, which are also a problem outdoors, just like they're a problem for many people indoors. So the question is, is I always seem to experience poor germination with my surface sown seeds outdoors. Do you have any tips specific to those types of seeds? So um, again, I'll mention that I plant in little troughs. Um, so it's really easy to know where I'm supposed to plant the seeds. And I sow them on the bottom of that trough. And then after they're sown, I mean, I walk along literally. So the image you're looking at, that's Bells of Ireland, I believe. And there's three rows. And I literally make the um, troughs by pulling one of our garden hose down the bed and make all the troughs at once. And then I plant one row at a time. I start, because, you know, our beds are long, right? 50 to 100 feet long, depending. Um, and I sow the seeds down in the trough. Then I go back do each row. Then I go back with our stand-up garden hoe and just tamp the seed into place. Because as you mentioned, it's really easy for things to happen to them. Lane, they can blow away yes. or whatever, you know, it's just so funny. Um, and so we do that and then I water them. Um, and I'm very careful to water using, we use a wand um, that has a um, lot of holes in the wand. So it's very a shower, more like kind of um, watering. Um, and I'll tell you that when we just really pay attention, does it get covered or not covered and give it water, um, then that makes a really, really big difference. Yeah. And I would just echo the things we already said for the previous question that a lot of surface zone seeds, not all of them, but a lot of them tend to be really tiny seeds like poppies or something. And those can very easily get blown away if you're sowing on a windy day. They can get flooded and covered unintentionally if you're watering a little too heavily. And that's another reason you may want to with surface zone seeds. We're going to talk about over sowing a little bit later. But if you do tend to have a struggle with surface zone seeds, you might want to consider sowing them just a little more heavily. And you know, Lang, what you just said um, before that, I want to just mention that you cannot look at the size of a seed to learn which way it needs. Because for instance, right. the of Ireland looks like little pea gravel, you know, it's yes. a rocky looking and it's surface sown yet buplurum is a smaller smallish seed and it needs darkness so you have to look it up that's why i'm telling you i carry my book literally out to the garden and i recommend you do the same yeah and floating row cover can again be very helpful for surface sown seeds because it not only helps to retain moisture but it also helps to prevent wind from just blowing the seeds away yes all right, on to another popular question. Weeds seem to overtake my direct seeded beds. How can I prevent this from happening? What are some of the things you tend to do, Lisa, that help to prevent those weeds from taking over the entire bed? Sure. So I lived that life for many years until I figured it out. Um, I would sow my seeds and then, you know, kind of all of a sudden spring was there and you couldn't even tell where the seedlings were. The beds were overtaken by chickweed or henbit. So my method of madness on direct sowing, we typically plant into 30 inch wide beds. I normally plant annuals, most of our annuals, four rows in a bed. Well, when I'm direct sowing, I only put three rows in a bed. That just allows me to be more, to freely use our hoe to cultivate quickly and efficiently. I learned that on a um, farm tour. I can remember Bob Woolham saying it, you know, I only sow three rows of seeds. So it's super easy and quick to weed. And it's like the light bulb went off for me a decade and a half ago. So I only sowed three rows. Um, and then about seven to 14 days after I've sown the seeds, I then start running the garden hoe, which is our stand up hoe with a um, really sharp blade. Just you're not going in the troughs and weeding. You're simply weeding the area between the troughs. That takes out 98 percent of the developing weed seedlings. And I will tell you that it changed my world. 
I do that about every seven to 14 days. Again, if it's a rainy fall, you may have to do it every seven days. If it's not rainy and stuff is growing slow, it may be every 14 days. And then all of a sudden, guess what? You know, it's winter. You can stop hoeing because everything's gone dormant. And then you might notice a weed here or a weed there in your row. And you don't mind bending over to pull that because there's not carpets of weeds. Yes. I mean, I will tell you that um, the stand-up garden hoe will change your world. And it makes you a stellar direct seeder if you follow those steps. Something else, too, that has to do with that space in between your rows is that one of the advantages to sowing in these troughs that Lisa's talking about is you can then focus your watering just in those troughs and purposely try to not water those spaces in between them, which would mean you're basically watering the weed seeds. Exactly. Exactly. It all works together. It does. And then the other thing I would add is to make sure, like we've said so many times, that you are sowing in these seeds preferred weather conditions and that you are keeping them moist so that they will germinate promptly and not just take so long to germinate that the weeds in the trough areas even start coming up and overtaking and outpace them. That's so true. And, you know, totally unrelated to this, but that's like a key piece of cover crop. People yes. plant the seed and they don't water because, you know, it's fields usually. They're waiting for rain, but rain doesn't come for two weeks. And by the time that seed gets the water, the weeds have completely gotten a head start and it just defeats the whole purpose. You know, it's, yeah, big picture thinking, right, Lane? I mean, you have to stop and think, all right, you know, it's still a little warm. That means my seeds aren't going to sprout, but guess what are going to sprout? The native weeds that right. are out there. So yeah, good point. So sow during the seeds preferred conditions, leave enough room for your hoe in between the rows. And when you're watering, try to avoid watering that negative space between your troughs. Yeah. Okay, moving on to our last question for this episode, and it's, I never seem to end up with a thick enough stand of plants. How can I overcome this? Yep, I so created my own failure the first few years because me just being me, so I would read the Larkspur seed or the Bells of Ireland seed, which is what's pictured here. And it would say, space a plant every nine to 12 inches. Well, I knew for cut flowers, they needed to be a little closer. So I'd say six inches. I was planting one seed every six inches and trying to be thrifty, trying to do the right thing. And I mean, and then as we know, things happen to seeds. So I made a flip about 10 or 12 years ago where I over sow. When you direct sow, first off, the seeds are the least expensive piece of your operation. Yeah. Even the expensive seeds are when you what value your time and labor and all that stuff. Um, so I over sow. Um, and, you know, you can do the math and sit down and say, all right, if I should put eight to 12 seeds for every foot of row, not bed, of row, and there's three rows, you can sit down and figure out how many seeds you need. But I am quick to overseed as I'll use all the seed. I don't, I'll try not oftentimes to over went to keep seed long. Yeah. I'll just sow it all. You know, I'll do what I have to do. And because I'd much rather thin and pull out plants than to have big old holes in my bed. So over sowing is, was my leading cause of failure. Um, and that's usually people just trying to be thrifty, but this is not the place to do it. No. So how many seeds do you aim to drop per inch when you're walking down your troughs, Lisa? And then how many seeds do you like to sow compared to the number of plants you hope to end up with too? It's like, for instance, Iceland poppies that are so tiny to give, I mean, this is overkill, but 20 to 25 seeds per 12 inches, because first off, Iceland poppies grow and perform beautifully even when they're crowded and they're right. tough to get to germinate. So I would rather have more than I need and thin them if I feel so led. Um, but for a larger seed, which you just seem to have more success getting it to sprout out in the garden like bells, um, you know, eight to 12 seeds per foot of row, because you can sit down and do the math. And, um, you know, if you're a flower farmer, you know, you buy the 20,000 seeds and pay 60 bucks or whatever it is. Because let me tell you, 60 bucks, three bunches of Bells of Ireland to a florist is just three bunches out of all those seeds is yeah. going to pay for the seed. I mean, that's the way I look at everything is, all right, how, how many more of this do I have to 
If I want to buy a piece of equipment, all right, how many more subscriptions would I have to sell to pay for that? You know, and that's the way I, the seed becomes very inexpensive, no matter how much it costs when you consider those things as a flower farmer. So I definitely think over sewing is the best tip here. Yeah. So go based on the guidelines that Lisa just gave. And the other tip I would say is to not thin it out right away. Resist the urge to thin those seedlings out as they start to come up in the fall, because it's not guaranteed that all of these plants, even the ones that germinated and they're growing into seedlings, they might not make it through winter for whatever reason. Yes. So it's a good idea to wait until the following year until you start to see signs of growth to then go ahead and thin them out. And that way you can be sure they made it through winter. That's such a good tip, Lane, because I had one particular year um, that the voles ate yes. larkspur. And, you know, so waiting until we say very early spring, like when, as soon as we take the row covers off and growth starts to happen, that's when you can start to actually thin. So that's a good point. All right. Well, that does it for this episode on direct seeding. Hopefully that helped to answer some of the problems you've been having. And I hope you've enjoyed this little cool flower trouble series. And we definitely hope that everyone either has some cool flowers started or planted out in the garden, or if you live in the Southern hemisphere, that you're actually getting ready to start harvesting some beautiful flowers. And thank you so much, everyone, for joining us again. We appreciate everybody that has left us ratings and reviews in a podcast app. And we always love your likes and comments over on YouTube. And just be sure to follow or subscribe wherever you're watching or listening so that you won't miss any of our future episodes. All right. Well, another great show, Lane. Thank you so much. And friends, remember to just check back here at same time same place for next week's and um we appreciate each and every one of you and whenever you need us you'll find us at thegardenersworkshop.com ciao bye